<laughs> you might think that there's no connection between James and Saul Cadars. But as I sat at the back thinking, come on, in a full, get, full legs good, two legs bad situation, Hilda Ogden is definitely going to be leading the animal <laughs> Um, well, thank you very much. Um, we're delighted to be back for what is our second academic archers conference. Hooray. Delighted, nay, amazed to be let back in the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, last year, you might remember, we banged on about unfeasibly large parsnips and, and pet food and uh, produce food. This year, we're sticking with peas and we're going to be talking about pets. Now, there are two main reasons why we chose this topic. Firstly, as you're probably all aware, the archers was originally produced in order to disseminate information to farmers and smallholders after the war. So really, animals are an essential reason why the arts exist in the first place. Secondly, animals are often used as significant dramatic devices within the arches. If you think of the key uh, pivotal memory that everybody has of the arches, it's a grace archer dying in the fire. Why did she die in the fire? She was trying to rescue her horses, exactly. Um, and also, on top of those two reasons, we're actually pet owners ourselves. But I have to say, um, <laughs> Annie's fun. But I have to say that Annie's more successful in this than I am because some girls are actually still alive. <laughs> Whereas over the last few years, I've come to think of myself as the Fred West. <laughs> Whereas all of mine are now certainly buried in the back yard. <laughs> and on that horrifying, <laughs> it all moves swiftly off. So um, we set ourselves some research questions uh, that we were interested in answering. I mean, we got particularly intrigued about the idea of metaphor. So as it says here, using a term that may not normally be applied to something to describe it and enable greater understanding. So, for example, it's raining cats and dogs. Okay. So we're interested in what metaphors do people use to describe their relationship with pets? Uh, and Paula mentioned earlier that uh, issue about private voices giving insights. Also, how do these metaphors translate to the archers, and how does that help us to understand and empathise with the characters? Just a little bit about the literature and what it says. So the first thing is, a lot of literature to say pets are good for people. Um, they, they provide companionship, they de-stress us, they lower our blood pressure. Uh, they provide us with activity, they help uh, with disabled support, and people love their pets. They'll tolerate any mischief and mayhem. They may even encourage it. They may boast about it. And I'm particularly proud of the way my dog Sprocket ambushes the Waitrose at delivery. <laughs> you know, the club for Waitrose because they love us. <laughs> He gets into the packaging, he gets the ham, and without the aid of scissors, he manages to remove the ham. And this is the example of dog shaming. <laughs> I eat all the ham, and I'm not sorry. <laughs> so people see their pets as members of the family, and that means that when a pet dies, they may well mourn their pet in the same way as they would a member of the family. The particular article about metaphor was from Belk in 1996, and through interviews, he identified five metaphors, pleasures, problems, parts of self, members of the family, and toys. And we were interested to see if that stood up to scrutiny. So we started by looking at reality, then we moved it to the archers. <laughs> People love talking about their pets, however they see them and how badly they are. So we got 270 supplies to our survey in just, just a few weeks, which were amazing. Probably the best <laughs> Cranfield survey. <laughs> <laughs> best, best not broadcast that. Um, now, over on the left-hand side, these are all the categories that Annie and I faithfully put down as what constitutes pets. And over on the other side, with all the kind of things that we forgot about, that people added in as well as <laughs> Um, we're kind of hoping that the worms are pets in their own right and not a nasty surprise that came in one of the cats we've got. <laughs> um, a lot of love for lizards there, ferrets, which is excellent to see Joe Grundy with a very kind of girl, and tortoises. There is only one tortoise in our survey, but he's very precious. He's called Arnold the tortoise. And um, I don't think you get a crush on tortoises, <laughs> but I've kind of developed a bit of a crush for Arnold. So remember him, because he may well appear in some of the future slides. He is Anne's tortoise. <gasps> no! I need to speak to you afterwards then. <laughs> because he is a legend. Absolute legend. Um, so what you can see is there are a very wide range of pets in people's households, and a lot of people have multiple pets, they just need to stick with one either. 
Um, and what we think is that um, we've seen a wide range of pets in the arches over the years. I don't know if anybody remembers Miss Babs, the Grundy's pig, or Eccles the peacock. I'm not sure whether you think it's still there. Still there. Is it still yeah. there? Yeah. Wow. There was a lot of tweeting about. There was a woman who had an emotional support peacock turned away from a plane ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was a lot on Twitter about Eccles oh, is an emotional it's support it's peacock. Excellent. That shows how closely I was. I don't really want to be scarred by a flapjack this time. <laughs> uh, but we don't think there's a vast variety of animals in the arches at the moment. So, the first thing we asked them was, do you talk to your pet? How do you relate to it? And if you do talk to it, how do you talk to it? Um, overwhelmingly, people do talk to their pets, unsurprisingly. 106 people, uh, I don't know if you can see this on the side, really, 106 people responded that they talk to them as if they're a child, um, and 36 people as if they're talking to them of their own age. 72 people as if they're talking to an animal. That kind of makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and some of them, it was a mixture of these, and for one person in particular, it's very contextual. I do talk to my pet like a child, but when he's pestering me for food, I explain to him like an adult. <laughs> special places or special furniture, um, anything like my cats, it was cardboard boxes, newspapers, laptops, anything was fair game. And most people's pets have multiple places where they chose to nest. So these are just a few of the examples that people mentioned. Um, but we pulled out uh, one or two of our favourites, and I think it probably relates to some of the more pampered pets in the survey. <laughs> And this is what happens when a survey question goes wrong. We ask, uh, we ask them, is that pet able to go wherever it wants? In the past? And if not, why not? And I believe it was one of my friends that answered this. And it's a fair point. <laughs> moving into my particular expertise in pet ownership, which is saying goodbye to animals. Um, we had a lot of, of very emotional comments from people in the survey and um, where they've been affected from the loss of the pet. And as we've seen in the literature, very much seen it like a loss of a member of the family. Um, and this is the one quote that really um, summed it all up for us. The pet was such a huge part of their daily routine and how much that they contributed to the well-being of the family. Um, I just wanted to show with hands in the audience how many people have actually been affected by the loss of a pet during their life. 
Not surprising, yes. Yeah. So you know, you know what that pain is about. Um, so now we get on to really the core question of the survey. How would they describe their pet in terms of bouts, metaphors? Um, so overwhelmingly positive. So 168 people said they saw their animal as a member of the family. 88 people saw it as a pleasure. 41 said part of me. And as you can see here, nobody, nobody classed their pet as a toy. And I think, going back to the, the dressing <coughs> situation, that's very funny. Now, you might see that four people describe their animals as a problem. <laughs> and I just, I just want to explain that actually this has nothing to do with inappropriate behaviour, either the owner or the, the, the pet. Um, it was to do with the fact that the owners were, that they weren't perhaps looking after them in, in quite the right way, that they were leaving them too long. Um, and in the case of darling Arnold Tortoise's owner, I'm sorry, I'm going to be very for Arnold the tortoise's owner, there's a very real problem with his life expectancy. Because normally a tortoise will live for about five, 50 to 100 years, even more. Not in my house, obviously. <laughs> Ten, years. Ten years max in my house. But um, they are genuinely worried that one day they will need to give him up if they had to move into sheltered accommodation. And now I'm going to read the quote that you left us because it, it, I find it very moving. Um, I should get you to read it. Uh, I bought Arnold with birthday money, seven and sixpence, when I was nine. I didn't expect him to be a lifelong responsibility because I didn't think in those terms at all at that age. I find it very hard to part with him. He's been a part of my life for more than 50 years. <laughs> and just a few extra quotes from people. My favourite one, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> and see how this compares. Uh, and let's do a case study of Ruby. And I think I'm right in saying that you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't know what kind of breed Ruby is, and this is how I imagine her. And notice that literature says that dogs are more friendly, submissive than cats, especially certain cats. <laughs> it's debatable who's the more submissive when you hear Lillian and Justin interacting with Ruby. Nancy Banks-Smith put 
does it. They can browbeat a bull, but they can't be killed. <laughs> the literature says that cats are more hostile than dogs. It says that they are, may engage in power relationships with humans. <laughs> it says that behaviour problems are the most common reason for getting rid of a pet. But it, there's also an argument that females have a more pro-animal attitude and they're more likely to put up with the mischief and mayhem. Let's just listen to this exchange between Peggy, Christine and Hilda and see what we think about that. Not a sound on the sofa, get off! Oh, hey, well, that heavy mistake. Ouch, you horrible creature! <laughs> oh, careful, Gilda! Oh, and she did it on the earth. She was on the sofa again, fur everywhere. Oh, let's shut the house door at night. Keep her out of here. <laughs> so, um, for Christine, she is obviously, I mean, there's no pro-animal attitude there, mm -hmm. uh, Hilda is obviously a problem, and I think Christine would be very happy to see her behind bars. Um, <laughs> but Peggy, though, I would suggest part of self. It's evident that Peggy feels a responsibility towards Hilda, despite her difficult character, and she feels the need to defend her actions, even when they're not cute, such as that episode when she was found to be killing birds. It's a realistic representation of a pet owner's attitude and cat behaviour, isn't it? Let's see what Twitter has to say. So, people don't think that that's how cats would normally behave. However, there is some enjoyment of the dramatic liberties being taken with cat behaviour and the possible havoc that Hilda could go on to wreak. <laughs> Which were what metaphors do people use to describe the relationship with pets? Is overwhelmingly as a member of the family, and most definitely not a toy or a problem. How do these uh, metaphors translate to the archers? Well, as we've seen with Justin and Lillian, not quite so clear cut actually within the storyline. And how does this help us understand the side of the character in the archers? Well, we really feel that it helps you to see a side that you wouldn't normally see. So we've seen with Justin and Lillian, we've seen this also with Christine, we've seen the slightly <laughs> more aggressive side. And uh, just to round up, we have a few recommendations for people. Firstly, to you in the audience, if you're going to buy a talk, just do it when you're very young. <laughs> <laughs> firm handover policy. To my, I don't want to be to the audience, but I think that ship has sailed for a lot of us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, we don't feel actually there, there are not enough pets or not enough variety of pets and breeds. so for the script writers, please bring back Mrs. Antrobus to bring more dogs yes. in. Yes! And where are all the fish? Although in the last few weeks, I think we've come to know the answer. I actually have nothing to do with that. And finally, a recommendation that we hope might help cheer Shula up, because God knows we need to cheer Shula up. <laughs> Um, in the course of our research, we found a community that actually enjoyed dressing up their horses. It's called Todrill. Has anyone ever heard of it? Yeah. It was new to me. You have. Wonderful. Here's just an example of what they do. <laughs> and on that note, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much.